Hello, and you are listening to a very special 100th episode of The Book Was Better. The podcast where we talk about the book of the movie. This week, we're talking about... License to Drive. Aruga. Hey, you. Crap, not look all of my Christmases have come at once. Yes. I've got Jess McLeod back. That's me. On episode 100. Can I you can't. believe that? No, I can't. I'm really, I'm really surprised that it lasted this long. When you found Over the Top at an op shop on your honeymoon, wasn't That's it? That's right. That's and right. Uh, you said, oh, no, maybe this is wacky enough to uh, sustain as a podcast. We, I actually read bits of it to my husband. Um, on our honeymoon. It's the only way I can get it up now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, I um, I, I need a couple of um, Amish people to rise, raise it like a barn. <laughs> yeah, shocked, horrified, all of these emotions. I know, like, you know, it's one of those things you talk about and you think, yeah, this is fun, we'll do this. And you think, okay, you have seven episodes maybe. I yeah. think the C list lasted 12 yeah. episodes. And here we are, episode 100. Oh, so if I'd known, I, later, I certainly would not have bothered starting it. And, you know, look, you've done um, over a third of those. Yeah. And then we've got all these other people that have come in and contributed and been a part of this process over the last couple of years. I can't believe people actually want to listen to this, let alone put in the effort to be on this show. <laughs> It really does blow me away. You know, starting from um, with Tristan Fiddler all the way through to Leah's second appearance uh, last week. It's amazing the amount of people, the amount of people that have come back. Um, The amount of spare time people seem to have. It's just amazing to me. No, I'm very humbled, really. It's very cool. It's very cool. And I know everyone, uh, not just me, is going to be really excited that you're back for 100 and uh, you chose this one. I did, I did. You know I like my 80s movies. Yep. You know I like my teen sex comedies. Sure, absolutely. And you know I like my Corys. Both Corys? Do you have a favourite Corey? I... I guess the more relevant question is which Corey do I hate the most? Hate the least? No. Uh, Well, I guess hate the least, yeah. So I actually think, and this is going to be controversial... Corey Feldman, I hate less than Corey Haim. And before this movie, I would have said, oh, Corey Feldman, what an annoying little shit. This movie really sealed the nail in... Oh, I shouldn't say that, should I? Oh, in the hate coffin. <laughs> oh, oops. Oh, too soon, Sorry. Jess. <laughs> Sorry. We're trying to keep this live. Apologies to the family and friends of Corey Haim who are listening. happy and... Yeah. No, I, I'm, I'm going to try to forget... Cake in the freezer. Forget his, <laughs> forget his sad ending while I talk about how much I hate him. But, yeah. How about you? I love Feldman. I mean, come on, Stand By Me, Gremlins, I've actually got Goonies, a lot of time for Corey Feldman. The Lost Boys. I don't Lost have Boys. a lot of time for modern Corey Feldman. <laughs> no. But back in the day, like, what a wild little animal. Did you ever see the the um, episode or a clip from the episode of the, the Corey's show where he was singing to his wife at, like, some anniversary or maybe even at their wedding or something because he's a singer now? And his way of doing it was no shit. He was wearing a, a mic clip to him and he grabbed her face and brought it right up to his face so their faces were nearly touching and just screamed the lyrics <laughs> into her face. I saw a shot. It was so romantic. A shot, um, a clip of him on a, like he, he'd be about like 20 or something, maybe 18, 19, and he was on like um, a talk show that looked like an afternoon almost um, Ellen or Sally, Jesse raphael kind of thing. <laughs> and he was dressed up as, like, Michael Jackson Thriller and he was singing this original <laughs> song and dancing. Oh. And the thing was, it wasn't like... He was doing it like it was a really, like, fucking hard rock, just awesome thing. He had all the hair <laughs> gelled and everything. But they were in that quite bright <laughs> midday studio talk show lights. And it kept cutting to the middle-aged female audience politely, like, <laughs> clapping and watching as he was just, like, fucking going for it. Like, 
<laughs> you got to admire his tenacity. <laughs> So, <laughs> and when we're gonna have a lot of Feldman talk, I'm obsessed with him. On the C list, he was like the mascot. We, yeah. we we used to catch up with Corey News all the time. Uh, that was a podcast did with Mike Taylor back before uh, book was better. <laughs> so um, I, I'm actually disappointed that License to Drive isn't really a two Corey movie. It's no, really a despite Corey the Hayne cover, movie. yeah, they're given equal space, uh, equal real estate, as they say on the cover. And, yeah, it's a Corey Haim movie with sprinkles of Corey Feldman. Yeah, Feldman's just a um, condiment. Yes, that's true. On the, uh, Which is how he tastes best, I think. Yeah, on the big wiener that is Corey <laughs> E. Haim. So, God, we're going to get We're going to have so many yeah, diversions along the way, so let's at least get started and then we can um, diverge. But uh, this was written by A.L. Singer. And believe it or not, I didn't know this until uh, last night, uh, that's a pseudonym for Peter Larangus, who's the author that wrote episode 99, The Sixth Sense. That's interesting. Under under Larangus? Yeah. Yeah, yeah right. Did. So he was more ashamed of this. Well, The Sixth Sense is actually pretty good. Okay. It's almost like a junior novel, but uh, he's very economic. Um, the episode has just gone up as I've, uh, I like I put it live about an hour ago as we're recording this, so no one's had a, you know, having a chance yeah. to listen or anything. But, uh, yeah, it's really quite good. It's quite solid. Like, yeah. he gets the job done quite economically. Okay. So this is... Um, I mean, I don't think the writing was terrible in this. The whole concept is terrible in yes. this. Yes. Although, d- I, I will point out, and you may have noticed this in my, um, my notes, I got to the end of it, and the very last thing that happens... Literally, that's when I realised this was supposed to be a comedy. <laughs> I wasn't joking when I said that. Like, all throughout this book, I thought it was like a teen drama, I guess. <laughs> I literally had no idea it was supposed to be funny. And when I watched the film, which has all these, like, you know, sound cues and visual cues that you're, it's supposed to be funny, even though it's actually not, I realised that the tone of this book is way off. Well, it's like a comedy of errors, isn't it? It's a um, one of those. It's almost like an 80s version of The Hangover with teenagers. This yeah. sort of night that spirals out of control, except yeah. uh, it doesn't really spiral out of control, out of control. Nothing has a payoff. Exactly. Yeah. I, I noticed A.L. Singer is actually an, an anagram of, of Larangus. Oh, well so, done. So, yeah. yeah. I, I think this is his um, shame name that he writes under. The shame file. License to drive. Should we read the opening? Yeah, let's do that. See, I like to read this as uh, one of the most disturbing descriptions of masturbation we've yet come across. Screek, 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 screek. I don't think you're doing that justice. Screek, 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 screek. Sweat poured from Les Anderson's brow. Even the smallest muscle in his hand cried out in pain. He looked up, his blue eyes darting wildly back and forth. How could anyone not hear him? Les quickly scanned the other students on the school bus. That's ballsy doing on the school bus. <laughs> Zombies, he thought. That's what they were. Each face was as dull and grey as the clouds that hovered outside. Each pair of eyes stared lifelessly out of the grime-caked windows. Not one of them moved a muscle. Well, maybe they've given up, Les said to himself. Maybe they don't mind being prisoners in this stinking jail on wheels. But not me. These chains can't hold Les Anderson. You do this well. Screech, 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 screech. I think the kids today prefer fat, 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 (laughs) isn't that? And then his jaw dropped open. He couldn't help it. The sight was enough to stun any 16-year-old guy. No, it wasn't so much the sleek, glistening silhouette of the 308 GTS. It wasn't even the deep, rumbling purr of the engine. It was the legs. Pure and simple, they were the longest, the smoothest, the sexiest pair of legs Les had ever seen, had ever imagined seeing. Sounds like a fucking weird car. See, that's your film right there. I feel like you need a (laughs) twist. On the boys' first car theme. Yes. Like, Michael Bay and Spielberg did it by making the car a transforming alien. Uh, Back to the Future made it a time machine. I reckon this should be a film where the car, instead of wheels, <laughs> has four shapely, sexy legs. And in the trailer, a cop would pull him over and lean in the window and go, you got a license for those legs? <laughs> And that song, Legs, You Should Got Legs, would be playing. Green lit. Uh, Yes. There you go, Roger Corman. Uh, But no, as it turns out, the legs are attached to a woman. Her face was hidden by the roof. That's okay. Women are just collections of sexy body parts anyway. I like the headlights and the tailpipe Mm -hmm. and the front tailpipe. (laughs) 
Up close, her legs looked even better than they had from the bus. She tossed back her lustrous blonde hair and gazed at Les with the sexiest smile this side of the planet Venus. The fuck are you talking about, A.L. Singer? This isn't a Star Trek novelization. Where does Venus come into oh, he's it? He's right, though. Those girls on Pluto have some super sexy smiles. <laughs> but you neglected to mention that he sees this girl in the Ferrari while he's chained to the bus. <laughs> and then he jumps out the fucking window, like yeah. through the glass, yeah. rolls on the ground. And you still thought this was like a, <laughs> a serious drama. I didn't think it was a serious drama, but I thought it was meant to be a lighthearted but serious look at a, at a, a child's pain or something. <laughs> so the, the woman is still in the car when Liz steals it. So Liz's fantasy establishes him as a complete creep. He steals a car and kidnaps a woman. Yeah, because teenage fantasies have really evolved. Like now she'd be a, what, a furry fox woman with 18 tits who was giving birth to herself. <laughs> and shitting. Yeah. Uh, Um, And then he causes a bus to hit a child on a bicycle. Les breathed a quick sigh of relief. In his mirror, he could see the boy spinning wildly on his rear tyre, confused but alive. See, the bike has just had its front half completely (laughs) sheared off by a bus. I don't think Les realises as he breathes a sigh of relief (laughs) that it's not the spinning that's going to kill him. It's the crashing painfully to the ground when you stop spinning. Um, And this, I, I love this, this is the most 80s detail The sexy woman lights up a cigarette. Well, I I think it reminded Les of his tiny dick. (laughs) I think he was able to imagine that. But um, note that this is all just a device so that uh, he can throw a match over his shoulder and blow up a gas station (laughs) and incinerate the bus and thereby killing all his fellow students. They're all just zombies who don't appreciate a good You must have, yeah, felt that this was a pretty dark (laughs) film at at this point. With his best, most modest Tom Cruise smile. And this is very 80s detail as well. If you wrote that today, it'd be with his most manic, terrifying Tom Cruise <laughs> smile. It did work, though. It had the desired effect. Uh, already, her lips were parted. Yeah. So, yeah, it turns out it's all a dream. Oh, such a clever writing technique. So original, fresh. Wouldn't this have been so much better as a short film? Like- <laughs> Kid is a prisoner on a bus, jumps out the window, kills everyone in an explosion, drives off with a hot girl in a car with legs. Yeah, and the word just comes up, fan. Mr. Gasket had taught driver's ed since before Les was born. No one in Sunny Meadows High could get a license without passing his course. It was said he held the job because he enjoyed watching students fail at something they wanted so badly. Rumour had it that some of his students were still trying to get their licences at age 30. Wait a minute. How does a driver's ed teacher control who gets their licences, much less control whether adults long out of high school get their licences? I feel like the American systems of doing things are incredibly ad hoc. (laughs) It's like in prom where the principal threatens to stop the bad boy from graduating if he doesn't spend, like, 24 hours a day helping make decorations. That's true. And they have that legal system where you have to, like, spend a night in a haunted house. So That's in order to, yeah. Inherit, yeah. Inherit something. Um, and what is wrong with somebody in their 30s not having their license? I this book was incredibly... Uh, <laughs> You're right. Prejudiced. This book is all about how people who don't have their license are losers. Yeah. How did you feel, I Luke? I felt pretty bad. Yeah, if you people should. don't know, listeners, yeah. I'm 38 and I don't <laughs> have my license. I've never had my license. I've never even taken the test. So it's not like I keep failing the test <laughs> like uh, this Corey Haim loser. <laughs> But yeah. Yeah, it's pretty it's pretty pathetic. When they bring out a car with four legs, <laughs> then I'll reconsider sexy legs. sexy legs. I'll be washing that car every morning <laughs> with my car. Oh god. And Les felt sick to his stomach as he realized there was no way he'd catch the early bus. Whoa. Way to raise the stakes. I feel so involved in this character's terrible fate. Didn't you think in the film, though, this was, like, straight out of the opening of The Simpsons? That's what Greg said. Yeah, like, Les is writing the lines on the blackboard and then there's suddenly some signal and then he just, like... Because he's writing, I will drive safely, I will drive safely, and then he just jets down the stairs like that. And this predates the beginning of The Simpsons TV show, I'm pretty sure, like the actual series. Yeah, Yeah. 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 So somewhere Matt Obviously, Graney, homage, this is his favourite yeah, film, Absolutely, licensed the skateboard. But this is what I mean about um, Ale Singer's 
writing. Like, you know, this this dude, Mr. Gasket, is not in the movie. Like, he just says, you know, wake up or something. There's no, you know, this uh, dark desire to stop kids from getting their licence. And there's there's no, like, he felt sick to his stomach. He's just like, oh, man. <laughs> and the more I read, the more I feel like um, Singer is aware of exactly how low the stakes are in this movie and he's trying kind of valiantly to raise them. Listen to this. He stopped in the middle of the road, fuming. He felt so, so powerless. That was the word. Word. It was more than embarrassment, more than anger. Without a driver's license, his life was nothing. What girl would look at a guy who had to run after a school bus? How far could a guy get with a girl, knowing that his mother would be by to pick him up at 10 o'clock because she needed to get to bed by 10.45? Les punched the air in frustration. Take that air! <laughs> High school life was a nightmare. It rewarded nerds like Natalie, who did everything by the book and didn't care about the finer things in life. Natalie being his twin sister? Yeah, as I recall, um, High School life was a breeze for nerds. I fail to see the logic in this at all. Like, if you apply yourself, you can get with a girl at four in the afternoon in a brother's treehouse. Like, you don't even need a car. I think it says a lot about where I am in my life, where I was like, get picked up at ten. You'll be lucky not in a school night, you little shit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I, I enjoyed this uh, book as a sort of um, almanac of the future for you, Jess. <laughs> You, no way, you know, I'm not having a Corey. Look at these teenage boys on the cover. They were once cute little babies no! that their, their mothers thought would just oh the God. absolute world off. Oh God. Do you think Corey Feldman always looked like that? Oh God. And now he's on the cover of a book oh on dressing you with his eyes. But at one point, he was a cute little baby. Oh, my God, that's so upsetting. That's genuinely upsetting me. Yeah, well, that's the truth. Let's move on. I'm still really impressed by you catching this um, A.L. Singer Larangus uh, really? anagram. The, the anagram. <laughs> Glad I can impress I'm you. still mind blown by um, ScarJo or GoGo. The Enid Coleslaw is Daniel Klaus. No shit. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, introducing Corey number two. It was only Dean. Car obsessed, girl obsessed Dean, whose bike was more a weapon than a vehicle. So this guy's really into cars and girls. Oh, this film has everything, all these different interesting characters. At this point, reading the book, I got really pissed off. Oh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I could tell from the notes. Because, <coughs> unlike the light-hearted film, it's taking these little shits problems really seriously. <laughs> so what I've written in my notes, which seems a little ridiculous now that I see the film, is I knew these guys in high school. They weren't victims of the system. They were just sexist, semi-neanderthal, car-obsessed, porn addict and fuckwits. Yeah, preach it, sister. <laughs> I'm I'm disappointed, as I said, at the lack of Feldman in this thing. I really thought they'd get equal time. Um, you know, he's got that presence. He's got the the Corey. He's got the little mullet. He's got the sunglasses. He apparently uh, chose his own wardrobe. Did he really? Yeah. So um, the army pants and everything. I feel like it's something we've seen him mm-hmm. wear mm-hmm. wear before. Um, and uh, it turns out that Dean Corey Feldman isn't so impressed by hot girl Mercedes Lane's uh, GQ model boyfriend. The only difference between you and that jerk is that he has a license and you don't. So, putting aside the license, they're both jerks. (laughs) True. (laughs) Uh, By the way, in the book, I don't know about the film, but in the book, um, the boyfriend's name is Paolo, and he's some kind of uh, ill-defined foreigner, which will come up later. This this book was really making me hate teenagers. Goddamn kids, I've got real problems. I don't give a shit you can't drive or get laid. Your life is... Easy. Yeah, see, I can't wait to have this conversation with you again in about 15 years. <laughs> but I, I think that's the thing, though, is teenagers have no agency or money, and I just think, what else do you want teenagers to do? Like, yeah. you know, if you've got teenage boys, they're definitely obsessed with sex. Yeah, and, uh, teenage girls. And they're obsessed with cars. Teenage girls are obsessed with sex. So, I mean, like, what's the perfect teenager in a movie, then? Like, you know, what should they... What, what do, is there a movie where you think, oh, yeah, that kind of captures the, like, ridiculous teen experience in a way that... Because, I mean, I know these kids are animals and they do some really gross things later on, but yeah. it's not that homogenised, like, high school musical thing either where they're not even human. But I don't think it's one or the other. <laughs> well, no, no, I don't either. So what is it? That's what I'm saying. Is there a movie that's kind of got it bad, got it right? Is it something oh, like... um God. Super bad where they're you know, still that actually came up yeah where mind. they're still pretty gross yeah 
but they're characters that are gross. It's not naturalized as this is the dominant ideology that mean everybody girls. should be following. Mean yeah. Girls is good. Um, Easy A. There's there's a few films yeah. that I think are, are more interesting than than this. Because I, I feel like when the young people, all they've got to think about is like you know they've got no money and they've got girl troubles and stuff. Like that's why the Spider Man movies always suck. Yeah. Because when he's I not fighting say, a CGI though, villain, that. I think that reveals a lot about your background that you said that's all teenagers have to worry about. Like, there are some teenagers who have to worry about, I don't know, coming out to their parents and getting kicked out or the fact that they're the vampire slayer and they have to, you know, fight vampires. And, you know, there are teenagers with real problems. Yeah. But every teenager, like, yeah, yeah. I guess I just, to me, this is the thing about teenagers in movies and TV, especially with their romantic problems. They're like, oh, God, I love him so much. They're like... Yeah, no, you know? absolutely. You're like, you'll be right. You probably would have bro- gotten bored with him once you went to college anyway. You'll get over but it. But for every sex comedy, there's a, um, you know, lifetime teen pregnancy movie oh, yeah. as well, isn't there? I mean, it's balance. It's just this is the this is the former, not the latter. Let's get back to it. Okay. Although I think this, this is probably not getting back to it. <laughs> <laughs> was this a good time to bring up a sore subject? Oh, well, there was no harm in trying. Um, Dad, do you think you could tell me for sure if I can use Mom's car Saturday night? Say yes, Les wanted to scream out, or nod your head, or just grunt if you're too busy. I mean, we all know I'll be legal by Saturday, and this party could make my reputation. I just need you to give me the word. Once again, I think my notes are probably reflective of my point of view at the time. No, just own it. (laughs) Maybe this book is just making me hate white, straight, middle-class male teenagers. Black kids are getting shot by cops, queer kids are getting thrown out on the street by their parents, girls are getting harassed and abused, but this little shit's biggest problem is whether he gets to turn up to a party in an Audi. Fuck him. This is like reading your angry diary. (laughs) I also wasn't impressed that when I could have been napping, I was doing this. And has Les ever been to a big party? Like, you'll probably have to park a street away if this thing is attended. Like, how will that make his reputation? No one's going to see him park this car. (laughs) Because presumably they'll be inside enjoying the party. Yeah. Weird. Yeah. Les felt his stomach turn. He wanted to run away from the dinner table or at least say something, but he sat still, reminding himself over and over, she's pregnant, she's pregnant, she's pregnant. Okay. This is mum is just eating mashed potatoes with potato chips and pickles and chocolate chips. Like, seriously, without the chocolate, it actually sounds kind of good. You, you can relate to this. Yeah. Uh, it's such an 80s trope, though. It reminds me of the mum serving up the moving food in the far superior Better Off Dead with John Cusack. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I haven't like, seen that in a long that time. That idea of teenagers getting, um, you know, just served slop by oblivious mothers. Yes. That, that happens all the time. But seriously, Les needs to give his mum a fucking break. Okay, listen, he and his twin are 16, his brother is 10. This is definitely an <laughs> accidental baby. This baby was not planned for. There is zero reason for this family to have a baby. Yes. It's it's total baby ex machina. <laughs> it's like, will the fact that this mother is pregnant be important later on in the story? Is this being, like, seeded for later on? Well, let's see. And boo-hoo, Les is sad because his dad won't bike him a new BMW. That's what he wants. And I noticed as well at this point while reading your crazy lady diary that there were typos <laughs> all over the place. And I could just feel you hate typing. <laughs> and action typing is something we're very familiar with. Hate typing, I thought you brought it yeah. to a whole new level. I'd like to see the your crushed, sad-looking, faded keyboard after this. <laughs> But Dad, Les replied, it wouldn't just be for me, it would be for Natalie too. Natalie gave him a scornful glare. Don't include me in your obsession. Well, excuse (laughs) me, Miss Mature, Les retorted. Is there anything wrong with being American? Don't don't ask ask that question. How's getting a German Nazi car being American? (laughs) Is there anything wrong with being mature? (laughs) Well, excuse me, miss, brushes her teeth every (laughs) single day. And Natalie, of course, I guess that American comment is because she has this commie boyfriend called Carl. So clever. I see what they did there. Top marks for that one. Carl said that in America... Top marks! Ah, I I nearly went over 
my head. Episode 100. <laughs> Nothing but net. Uh, <laughs> Carl says that in America, the people are misled to believe a car represents freedom and individuality. In essence, it is more oppressive than anything else, burdening the individual with materialistic costs such as insurance, gas, and repairs. Carl's right, actually. <laughs> to be fair, though, we're talking about a people that think that thinly sliced fried potatoes represent freedom. <laughs> 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 it, does, it doesn't take much for them to run with it. Shed a tear. Les dropped into his chair as if it had a pants magnet. Yeah, I turned the floor into a pants magnet. I need to get me one of these magnets. <laughs> Les Singer just uses that as though it's a phrase. You know, a pants magnet. <laughs> <laughs> well, they were really big in the 80s. And Dean, oh, fucking Dean. Dean is sitting in his car out the front of their house Honking the horn. What a little cunt. <laughs> in the front seat, Dean's mother and little sister leaned away from him with dull resignation. They were used to this. This kid needs a good ass kicking. He's doing this from the back seat, by the way. Control your son, mum. Look, no adult has ever been able to control the felt dog <laughs> in a movie or real life. And I, for one, think we should keep it that way. <laughs> You're forgetting, like, this, you know, rap scallion, he was the sole cause of the gremlin outbreak in 1984. <laughs> he got the Mogwai West. So many died. <laughs> yeah, he just doesn't give a shit. Okay, and this car pulls up full of older dudes and they yell at the, the kids. Um, it's two high school kids getting, getting shit for getting driven to the party. I don't know about you, but when I was in high school, everyone got dropped by, off by their mum. Like, how else would you get to a party? We just walked to parties. Like, the parties were held by our school friends and we all lived near the school. Yeah. And if we didn't, we'd stay, like, at a friend's place who did live near the school. So, yeah. And these guys giving them shit looked, quote, like they dropped out of high school sometime in the previous decade. The fuck do they care what two high school kids are doing? <laughs> The Jolly Roger on their antenna flapped in the breeze and their car horn blared out the funeral march. Yeah, these guys are definitely very intimidating, scary, not at all laughable. But in the film, yes. they shout at these kids, does your mommy hold your dicks when you take a piss? <laughs> I was not prepared for that. They are, the, they are awesome characters in the movie with their like, bleach blonde hair and the um, they just instantly, you know what these guys are about. It's a fucking great line. Corey Feldman like looks at his mom who's looking like kind of shocked and just goes, oh, have you met my friends? <laughs> Like, it's the best written line in the entire film. It's true. I like this quote. They were huddled around polished, glittery driving machines. I think Singer is getting sick of typing the word car. He's really going to have to stretch. <laughs> uh, it wasn't necessarily the best-looking guys who had the cutest girls or the biggest guys or even the coolest. It was the guys who had the slickest cars. So uh, by that rationale, uh, at the party, Buffy's dating, what, a 55-year-old obese <laughs> bank manager with a ponytail <laughs> and Susie's dating Batman. It's not usually normal guys that have the, uh, that's true. The cars. <laughs> and this high school party has caterers. The more, and when I watched the film, these kids are fucking rich little shits. They all live in these massive, massive houses. They've all got these fancy cars. Yeah. I, that was not the way I grew up. And Dean says, why am I so alone here? I'm good looking, I've got a great sense of humour, and yet there's not one single female within 20 yards of me. Can you find one of them who isn't within arm's reach of a car? And then two pages later he says, my brother used to go there every weekend, he said. He says the ratio of girls to guys is five to one. And we're not talking dogs, we're talking bunnies. The place is a paradise. Yeah, the reason girls don't like you is your mum drives you around. That must be it. The funny thing is, I don't think this is a character. Like, <laughs> th no, this is straight yeah. up Corey Feldog. He is still this guy. Now, Jess, we do not have a photo section in this book. No, it's a shock. So isn't it? I wanted to take this opportunity to show you a couple of photos. Sure. Just to show that, you know, you can't take the Corey out of the Feldog. Okay, all right? I'll try to give you a, a verbal reaction. Vice Magazine. Mm. did an um, article about Corey Feldman's birthday party. Oh, God. Corey Feldman has this, like, little business called, or did have, I don't know if he still does, called Corey's Angels, and he throws the sickest parties with the hottest honeys. Oh, my God. And people, men, can pay $250 to come to one of these parties at Corey's house, and females, they can get in for free, but they got to wear lingerie. Oh, gross. The whole time. Jesus Christ. And Vice... <laughs> Um, Corey would only let them publish it if they approved. He, he approved the article. 
So they wrote the most, like, mocking, sarcastic article, and he didn't get that. Oh, no. And then he got into an argument with them about the photos, and all these photos were terrible, and, you know, this is defamation and stuff. So then they posted more photos that made it look even worse. Oh so gosh. I want you to have a look at this um, party at the, the Fe- uh, Feldman Mansion. There's Corey there. That lady? No, that's Corey. Is that is that Corey Feldman's mum? This is Corey Feldman. I don't know who this lady is. Is she wearing her pajamas? But look, everybody looks kind oh, of busted up and gross. Corey's got long black hair. He it's looks very old. I think this is about his fortieth or something. But oh, look, the girls look so bored. And look at yeah, they're checking their phones. Look at the oh, posters in the, the posters background. Posters are all for his. He's got films. the lost, not just the lost boys, the lost boys two and three. Oh Jesus. He's got, um, he has got a license to drive poster. He's also got fan art that people like have painted of him in the house. There's the Goonies. There's his uh, masquerade mask. Oh, I thought this was going to be funny, but it's so sad. Isn't it weird? So that's what I'm saying. Like, this is the guy, the all bunnies, no dogs. This is him. This is a picture on his piano, a headshot of Corey. Oh my God. Um, Look at this guy, $250. Oh, so that ladies can pretend that they want to be around you. Yeah, isn't that amazing? You know, the best thing about that guy you just showed me. Okay, so obviously these guys are trying to pretend they're in some kind of low-rent Playboy mansion. And so that guy was wearing a robe, but he didn't get the memo about it being like a velvet or silk robe. So it was a terracloth robe like you wear. Well, that that is the whole vibe. (laughs) Is is that it, it's a low rent? Like he wants Aww. the lifestyle of Hugh <laughs> Hefner. <laughs> okay, we just came across some of the fan art. <laughs> and I'll just I'll just read like um, a little example of this article just to get the um, get a sense of, of of what Vice said about. Maybe the, this should be our new event. podcast. We just look at pictures on Vice magazine and people listen to our reactions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I should. I feel I should mention the parties are only two hundred and fifty to attend. If you're a guy, chicks get to go for free as long as they're pre-approved by Corey and are willing to wear lingerie for the duration. Which may sound unfair if you're a dude, but can you fold a brother for doing anything possible to stop his shindig from boiling over into a full-blown sausage party? Don't like act like you wouldn't do the same thing if you had the option. Also, he's Corey fucking Feldman. He can do whatever he wants, man. And this kind of writing is punctuated by the most depressing photos of women who probably moved to LA with the intention of becoming models or actors and have not made that dream come true. They're standing around checking their phones. Oh, God, this is so sad. So, there you go. That's our photo Oh, that was a real (laughs) (laughs) deal. That's what I'm saying, though, man. Like, that's the guy. You can't can't change him. Uh, That's who he is. Oh, Jesus Christ. If you found yourself in the back seat of a car with one of these wenches, do you ever wonder wonder what kind of car it would be, Dean asked? Then they match up the girls around them to the kind of car they think would get this girl to fuck them. Our heroes, ladies and gentlemen. They in the film they talk oh. about like which car do you think the, each girl would lose their virginity in? Yeah. And then they show this bigger girl and they say a garbage truck. Yeah. Ah! I don't want to serious this up too much, but as I was reading and watching, I just kept thinking, this is rape culture. This is the kind of objectification of women that leads to guys thinking it's okay to, you know, make out with girls while they're unconscious. Spoiler. Anyway. And this is 1988 or 5. 88 or 9. No, it's definitely 8 or 9. I mean, not that long ago in the big grand scheme of things. And um, I will say, I couldn't find many book reviews, but there are over 120 reviews for the film on Amazon, and they're like 90% five stars. People love this film. Jesus Christ. And of course, the girl Les is in love with is called Mercedes, because just like cars, women are objects which can be purchased with money and then manipulated to do your bidding. Is that true? (laughs) (laughs) You'll never know because you don't have a license to drive. I've got some money, though. Standing in the doorway, her long legs silhouetted through her dress by the light behind her was a figure so sultry and smouldering that Les thought he would burn up just from looking. She's not even a person, she's a figure. And I don't think this is Singer adding extra sexism so much as picking up on the way women are portrayed in the movie. And now having seen the movie, he cut a lot out. Like, there's so much more. I think he's just committing to the sexism. And this, by the way, is the young 
Heather Graham mm. uh, in one of her first roles, and a role that kind of makes Roller Girl look sophisticated. Yeah. Mm. And she comes across as a real bitch in the book. She hardly has any kind of uh, personality, but all she wants to do is get back at her boyfriend, Paolo. And in the film, she's she's much more innocent, I think. But she has rights. That's true. Suddenly, Mercedes stormed away from the doorway directly towards them. Her stiletto heels dug holes in the carpet. Behind her was Paolo, looking about five years older than everyone else and very uncomfortable. Mercedes' voice rose above the noise. You don't own me, she yelled to Paolo. I can do whatever (laughs) I like. Women have rights, you know. I don't care if you're used to women worshipping the ground you walk on. In the movie, she says, women have rights, not like in Kuwait or Pakistan or wherever. Yeah. You notice most of the weirdly offensive stuff is missing from the book. Yeah. So I like to imagine that it wasn't in the script, but there was such a party atmosphere on the set that they made a lot of this <laughs> shit up on the fly. And so, classic move. Uh, to piss Paolo off, Mercedes says she has a date. With who? With, with... Him! Mercedes spun around and pointed at the first person she saw. Les. Sounds reasonable. Definitely the kind of thing girls do. Girls are so crazy. Unfortunately, it was Les from the, that porn shop show. <laughs> <laughs> at that moment, Les felt as though he'd been paid a visit by Santa Claus, Hugh Hefner and Darth Vader. <laughs> Can we unpack this for a minute? Yeah, there's no further explanation, is there? <laughs> no. There's no follow-up. And then he just sense. moves on. I've got this, though, Jess. I figured this out. Santa Claus, because he feels like he's just been given a wonderful present. Mm-hmm. Hugh Hefner, because that present is a beautiful woman. Darth Vader, because he's hoping he can feel his presence. Yeah. 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 See? I do not understand what that means. That makes sense. I cannot believe you, Dean said the next day as he climbed into the bus. You're about to blow the greatest night of your life for a girl who doesn't know you even have a pulse. After all these years, we finally get a chance to go to Archie's and now you're telling me it's off. Do you like my <laughs> yeah, <laughs> impression? It, it needs to be, like, incredibly more gravelly. <laughs> um, for the record, okay, Archie's is this burger joint. For, for some reason, they need a car to go to. Um, it's the one with all the bunnies and no dogs. But here's the thing about, you know, and we talk about raising the stakes. Why can't they just do that next Saturday? Because the siren song of the hamburger <laughs> is too strong, Jess. Once you've got a, like, the idea into your head, you've got to get on that shit. Charles leaned over Dean's shoulder and said, Why don't you ask her to make sure? Les shrugged. I'd love to, Charles, but I can't talk to something I can't see. Last <laughs> night was the closest any of us have ever been to her school. To her. They've yeah, been to her. <laughs> What is she, Batman? She goes to your fucking school. (laughs) Jesus. She's not in the same remedial classes? I guess so. Maybe it's a Lady Hawk situation where she's like a hawk in the day (laughs) and he's a wolf at night. (laughs) Uh, This is pretty hot. A few feet away, Mercedes sat on a bench reading a glossy fashion magazine and sipping apple juice. A drop of apple juice dribbled on her lower lip. She licked it off with a languid sweep of her tongue. Oh, a sexy dribbling scene. He is. He's imagining his juice on her lip. Oh, I also, get it. Also, apple, original sin, now in juice form. So clever. I think it's very clever. So, okay, skipping over a bit here, but Les is driving his granddad's vintage car. This is the one with the liver-spotted legs with the knobbly knees. <laughs> When you were reading this book, did you expect his car, the granddad's car, to be much cooler? Because it really did look like the kind of car a granddad would drive to me. <laughs> it was not that great. Anyway, he's driving this car with his with his dad, who's doing this huge favor, um, you know, taking him for a drive. Um, and he begs his dad to let him drive past Mercedes alone to impress her. You're asking me to let you drive this car alone without a license? Are you insane? I'll just drive by, say hello, and circle back, Les promised. It'll take two minutes. I just want to see if she was serious. Mr. Anderson looked deeply into his son's pleading eyes. Then he glanced up at Mercedes, who was now a block away. The sight of her seemed to make his will soften. After all, he was a human and a male. Ew! She's 16, you fucking creep! The same age as your daughter? His will softened and his pants stiffened. Oh, my God. Doing a solid for his son. Fuck. So, Les is fucking idiot. She asks him to drive her somewhere, and he just... He does. He abandons his dad and drives her without a license. What a dickhead. And at this point, I wrote, I hope the rest of this book is him getting grounded and crying. 
I didn't get this at all. She's like, drop me off at friends. And he's like, sure, like, this is a good thing. How does he know it's not the 55 year old banker with the ponytail that's like banging her? And so he gets back. You're like, oh, this is going to be huge. He just tells his dad to put himself in his shoes. He caves. Fucking terrible parenting. No wonder his boy's such a little shit. They want, he wants his son to be happy. And this is a creepy moment, not in the book, it's in the film. He cuts Mercedes' photo out of the yearbook and sticks it on a soft porn picture of a scantily clad woman washing a car. What a dreamboat this guy is. You don't know how rough life was before Photoshop. <laughs> you don't appreciate what, what people had to go through to like imagine uh, people they had crushes on naked. <laughs> okay, so Les takes the written portion of the driving exam and fails it. What a fucking moron. Jesus. The message on the screen glared at him, imprinting itself in his brain like a cattle brand. He couldn't take it. He had to wipe it out. Whack! Before he could stop himself, he smacked both sides of the computer. Instantly, the screen blipped off. Les looked around. Up and down his row, students stared at their blank screen in shock, their hands shooting up in the air. You asshole, Les. Learn some goddamn impulse control. The computer is sentient, though. It talks to him yeah. in the film. It's creepy. I honestly feel like this is a prequel to Terminator Rise of the Machines, which we've already established is a prequel to Pixar's Cars. <laughs> so, yeah, r- 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 you know, get your head around that chain of events. And now one of the stupidest things in the movie, uh, which is entirely composed of stupid things, happens. The woman walked up to the counter and smiled at him. Well, you'll have to thank your sister for this one. What do you mean, he asked. At the present moment, the Department of Motor Vehicles computers are down, so we can't get your test results. However, considering your sister received a perfect score, we're going to pass you and allow you to take your road test. She shrugged. How different can you and your twin sister actually be? Well, I do know from popular culture that the DMV are famous for being helpful and accommodating. (laughs) Yes. Uh, by the way, there were over 40, uh, 47,000 deaths by motor vehicle accident in 1988. Yeah, so much for American individuality. This is like, <laughs> sorry, Mr. Black Man, the computer crashed before we got your results, but how different can you be <laughs> from those other black men over there? His driving test guy uses one criteria, whether or not you spill his coffee. So I guess if you break for a child running in front of the vehicle, you fail, but if you just keep drifting between the lanes, you're fine. And this is uh, James Avery, right? The dad from... Um Fresh Prince. Oh, is it really? Or the uncle. He was oh, the okay. Uncle, wasn't yeah, yeah. Also, the voice. Some people's dad. Of the Shredder. No way. Yeah, in the wow. original Turtles cartoon. There you go. What I'm trying to say is that most inspectors use a checklist. He leaned forward in his seat, holding up a clipboard. I don't believe in them. With a sudden flick of his wrist, he tossed the clipboard out the window. <laughs> he must go through a lot of clipboards. <laughs> it's 5.45 <laughs> at the DMV. All the staff are leaving, except for James Avery, who's scrounging around in the car park, collecting <laughs> his discarded clipboards for his b- big performance tomorrow. <laughs> You're still doing the clipboard thing? <laughs> I love the clipboard thing. It works. <laughs> okay, after all that, the computer's come back online and he doesn't get his license. When is something going to happen in this fucking movie? Speaking of fuck words. Oh, yeah, in the movie, um, the lady says, you mustn't fuck with the Department of Motor Vehicles, Mr. Anderson. And then she somehow tears a laminated license in half. What a badass. See, I don't even know what a license looks like in 80s America because they keep referring to it as a piece of paper as well. I'm assuming it's scribbled on a fast food napkin. (laughs) On his desk was a gift-wrapped box with a card on top that said, Good driving, love mum and dad. He tore the box open and pulled out the gift. A chauffeur's cap. Les felt tears struggling to pour out. (laughs) (laughs) I can't tell if his parents were really confident he would pass or just super passive-aggressive. If girls go wild at slick cars, just think of what they're going to do when they see that (laughs) chauffeur's cap. Because girls fucking love the Mr. Toad look. This was actually not in the movie, by the way. (laughs) They looked at him expectantly, wide grins on their faces, and all of a sudden, in a flash of inspiration, he knew just what to do. Oh, a flash of inspiration? This must be an exciting and complex scheme. This is a Corey plan. He's going to lie and say he has his license. Yeah. But his dad is such a sadist. At this point, I I loved him. I was so team dad. But before he could open his mouth, the door burst open. Dad stood smiling at him, carrying a bottle of champagne and two glasses. Let's, my boy, Mr. Anderson said. We're drinking a toast to you. Dad, that's very thoughtful of you, Les replied. But you know I shouldn't be drinking and driving. 
Mr. Anderson just smiled in answer. He popped open the bottle and poured Les a glass. Just raise your glass. He held his own glass high in the air to saving me $26,000. Les raised his glass and took a sip. I don't get it. $23,000 for the BMW and $3,000 for the insurance. How did I do that? Les asked. With this, his father casually reached around to his back pocket. He whipped out a sheet of paper. His parents found the fail test. This book is like that good news, bad news improv game, except less exciting and not funny. And it turns out the champagne bottle was full of piss. (laughs) (laughs) So, fast forward. He steals his granddad's car. His sister steals his mum's car. What is wrong with these children? What did their parents do to make them this way? And then in the movie, he breaks the fourth wall. What the fuck? What are you, Deadpool? He looks at the camera and says, an innocent girl, a harmless drive. What could possibly go wrong? He's literally tempting fate. (laughs) And uh, coining the tagline. I want a justice of the peace now, Les thought when Mercedes came to her front door. But all he could say was a feeble, you look great. She's so sexy, I need to sign a statutory declaration to that effect. Gotta get it zoned into a sexy zone. (laughs) Seriously, though, this book is just like set up a situation and diffuse it. Set up another situation, deflate it. So they drive to a nightclub that has valet services, but the valet seems untrustworthy. So he parks in a towaway zone. What is going to happen? A tow truck comes. He just gives the guy money and he goes away. Oh, Mercedes gets into the nightclub and he doesn't. She just comes out again. Oh, now he has no money. Uh, that's fine. She just wants to make out with him. Or oh, his tape gets chewed up and the only tapes in the car are old people music. That's okay. Frank Sinatra is perfect. There's no consequences and no tension in this movie. And thankfully you condensed a whole lot of this book into that little uh, little rant, which I love. <laughs> I was yes. like, I should say something about this stuff. And I was like, but just sum it up so well. I I'm just going to roll with I? it. And this is actually a note I made to you. Yes. I said, gah, there is a really creepy rape joke to be made on page 79, but I really don't want you to. Yes, of <laughs> Sorry course. To I, I go there. I look through. I'm, I'm trying to find what you're referring to. I assume it's he smiled. It couldn't get much better than this. Or could it? Suddenly he got his answer. Mercedes passed out. Yeah. But I personally think 79, page 79, should be celebrated for Les yanked himself away. <laughs> get up, he ordered. Get off the hood. <laughs> Literal hood. Uh huh, thank you. And he took off the blanket, a wide gaping dent <laughs> stared up at him. And there were before the thing you were referring to. So I was like, oh yeah. And then I was like, oh yeah. And then I was like, oh. <laughs> well, that's not funny at all. Yeah, so <laughs> the dent is from he and Mercedes dancing on the hood of the car. That's really a thing that people do. Caves out, she passes out. Fucking hell. So. Don't worry, it's instantly fixed by Dean, a high school kid with a mallet who can apparently repair huge dents without a trace. I kind of have experience with this. <laughs> you Just out of high school, I I got into my, I don't know why, my friend, um, who actually listens to this show, um, said, you know, why don't you back my car out of the car park? That's a how I remember it. I don't know. <laughs> if, like, it was my idea or whatever. And um, I'd never been behind the wheel before. Jesus Christ. And I backed it into a pole. I went very fast and backed it into a pole. <laughs> Jesus Christ. And, uh, yeah, they hammered it out. But um, he, his dad helped him. Mm. But, yeah, it was fine, which is great because I had no money whatsoever. Then why does it cost, like, a zillion dollars and take two weeks for a panel beater to do I don't it? know. Like, if Corey, I mean, Corey <sighs> me has got to be good at something, right? It's, it's not, true. It's not singing. Uh, so now Dean blackmails him into driving to this fucking burger joint he's obsessed with, the one with the bunnies. What a shithead. He's going to be one pissed off American when he realises that no dogs refers to the hot kind. <laughs> uh, where are we? Now, uh, now he starts taking photos with a flash inside the car. And he's taking photos of the unconscious girl. Even better, in the film... He's opening up her shirt and taking photos. If this was 2014, though, they wouldn't be able to stop her from taking photos of herself in the car, probably until she passed out. And then the shithead keeps flashing. The flash gets in Les's eyes. He can't see. They're flying through the air. They're all going to die. Oh, the park perfectly safely. How exciting. Missed another great exit point for this story. Yes. (laughs) 
Dean's grinning face peered up at Les. Mercedes had fallen on top of him, still unconscious. Her lips were slightly parted inches away from his. He puckered his lips and maneuvered his face closer to hers and closer. Oh, what a charming scene of near sexual assault on an unconscious teenager. What a laugh riot. Was this all improvised by uh, Corey Feldman? I'm not sure. Presumably. I have no idea. And this is the crazy bit where the book and the film completely diverge in plot for a long time. You know this, right? Did you see the film? Yeah, I did. I don't know if I noticed. You didn't notice? There's a huge difference in plot. Okay, in the film, let's talk about what happens. A drunk guy... Oh, yeah, that was... Yes, that was... They were reshoots. I did read about that. Really? The, the very end... With the grandfather returning. No, no, and, no, no, no. No, no, and the drunk guy. Yeah. Both of those sequences were all reshot. Oh, okay. They were all reshoots. Right, because, yeah, in the film, a drunk guy gets into um, their car, they get into the drunk guy's car and chase him and theirs, and the, the car gets smashed. This is kind of actually more interesting, but also more stupid. Across the street, high on a platform under a garish neon sign that said, Sick Sam's 24-hour rent-a-car was a Cadillac, a turquoise 72 sedan de Ville, absolutely identical to the car Les was driving. That is such a great business name. If there's any name that inspires trust, it's Sick Sam. Hi, they call me Sick Sam. I rent cars and shit on glass coffee tables. <laughs> I remember, like, being in this country town and in this dodgy little deli and they had a sign that said Sexy Sandwiches. <laughs> And I expected the kitchen door to just open for a second and me to just see this pale white ass like, <laughs> humping one of them. That's a good story. <laughs> it's pertinent to so many things, too. <laughs> You'll never get an opportunity like this again as long as you live. We'll cruise up to Archie's without worrying about scratching the paint, dirtying the interior, or smashing the car. So Dean's idea, just to get this completely clear, is to steal this car, leave their Cadillac in its place, so they can trash the stolen car and return it. What kind of fucking psychopath is he? The persistent kind. <laughs> <It's> okay. <laughs> and then we have the third scene so far in the book of someone stealing keys from a sleeping person. <gasps> oh, he dropped them on Six Sam's shoulder. That's fine. In this movie, people sleep through anything key-related. It's like Sheriff of Nottingham Syndrome. <laughs> Mercedes' limp body was growing heavy in Les's arms. He watched impatiently as Dean opened the Cadillac's trunk. Les looked into its vast blackness and shook his head. I don't know if this is a good idea, he said. Jesus Christ, what is wrong with these fucking kids? 15 years, Jason, you're going to have to deal with this all yourself. Oh, Come my God. Come back with a girl asleep in the trunk. It's a comedy. A comedy, people. Meanwhile, Natalie's at a protest against the movement of military hardware through the streets. This was actually me at 16. I was the commie nerd. So, yeah, you're picking on these guys. <laughs> Look at you. No, she's great. I was great. Natalie had come to this rally full of conviction, but looking at those policemen coming out of their cars with billy clubs strapped to their belts, she wasn't so sure. Don't worry, Natalie, there are TV ca cameras there and you're a white kid. You'll be fine. By the way, Natalie is the hottest girl in the film. I mean that seriously. I think she looks great, aside from the brown blouse thing that she's wearing. She is um, the older daughter in The West Wing. Yeah. The science daughter. Yeah, I think she's lovely. Yes, she is. she's very beautiful. As Les drove closer, he stared with wonder. Oh, I, by the way, sorry, just going back to this, that whole Natalie subplot, what is the point of it? Uh, she's just like the opposing ideal, isn't she? I guess so, but there's nothing comes of it and it's so boring. She's the voice of the audience that is you. <laughs> yeah, that's true. As Les drove closer, he stared with wonder. Archie's was a glittering neon and chrome masterpiece. A slice of the 50s gone high-tech. Dozens of BMWs, Maseratis and Porsches idle at curbside in front. He had to squint at the light reflected off their polish. Each car had a tray full of food attached to a front door window. Kids flocked around each tray, laughing, dancing and eating. Did I miss something? Do they live in Beverly Hills or something? How do these kids all have Maseratis? And... Why is the best thing they can do on Saturday night? Eat burgers in their cars. It's hard to imagine anything more depressing, really, than just, like, eating a hamburger in a car. Seriously? Like, on a date. Yes. Les passed out the fries and Pepsis. My dreams never get this good, he said. <laughs> My fantasies never get this good, Dean answered. That's so sad. It's not even coke. <laughs> it's true. 
<laughs> and but Pepsi was fucking onto it back then, weren't they? Like Back to the Future is a Pepsi film too. Mm. It really was the choice of like the next generation. So they dent the pirate car from the party. They drive away before the guys can smash up their car. The pirates race after them. Oh, is it going to get exciting? No. Before anything exciting can happen, the baddies drive into another car. The dickheads get away safely, but without any of the bunnies. And look, you were starting to fail, <laughs> fail in the notes here. I wrote, Luke, I can't recap any further. It's your turn. This book is killing me. And I wrote, no way. <coughs> You're doing so well. So... More non-events keep happening. This is my way of, you know, suggesting you might write something. You've written nothing. Natalie I sees... wrote comments. <laughs> yeah, I know. Do you know what, how nice this is for me to have somebody <laughs> else write the notes first? 100 episodes, <laughs> Jess. Natalie sees him driving. Uh, she yells out that he doesn't have a licence, but a siren drowns her out so his friends don't find out. And I was watching this with Grug, and he's like, why doesn't he just tell his friends he doesn't have a licence? Like, they've stolen a car. At this point, his friend's going to be like, that's cool, man. Driving around without a license. Cool dude. No, but that's <coughs> his masculinity. That's like telling his friends that he doesn't have a dick. Right. Okay. So the Cadillac appears on TV, which is his parents are watching. Oh, no, they're asleep. Oh, a cop pulls him over and finds out he's driving without a license. He's about to discover he has an unconscious girl in the trunk of the car and the car is stolen. Oh, there's a call for assistance, and the cops just leave. Yeah, like, this had potential to ramp up insanely here. Yes. But it's all diffused. And I like comedies where bad shit grows into, like, epically colossal shit. Absolutely. And I don't mind bad characters doing bad things. Yeah. But commit to it. Yes. And don't naturalise it either. Make us aware that this is a really fucked up wrong thing that's going on, and then I'm on board. Exactly. And my note here is, God, some more shit happens, I guess. Things happen and nothing matters. Finally, something in his mind snapped. He grabbed onto the caddy's tailpipe and pushed himself out from under the car. Hey, hey, he yelled. What do you think you're doing, man? The three goons stared at him, slack-jawed. Les checked out the car. The headlights had been kicked in. The windshield wipers, side mirrors and hubcaps lay mangled on the ground. He spun around and held out his hand to the driver. Give me that sledgehammer. Stunned, the driver didn't move. Les looked at him as if he were a misbehaving child. Come on. What are you, attached to it? Give it and give me it. He lunged forward and grabbed the hammer out of the driver's hand. You think you geniuses know how to wreck a car? I'll show you turkeys how to wreck a car. What the fuck? This isn't in the movie. Like, you remember this isn't in the movie, right? No, not really. So... <laughs> There's no stuff happened at this oh, point. So, I expected you to fucking write notes about where we got to, but we'll just talk about it. Um, at this point, Sick Sam has closed his 24-hour-a-day business, got inside the rentable Cadillac, which is actually Grandad's car, driven to this really dodgy dive bar. They followed him, but the pirate guys are there, and they start smashing up the car. And then, for some reason, he decides the best way to stop these guys is to start smashing up his car himself. He wants to go crazy, yeah. It's, the, it's like when um, the Joker turns up in Vicky Vale's apartment. And there's Bruce Wayne. He doesn't have the bat suit. He doesn't have his batarangs. He doesn't have mm -hmm. his, like, bat plane. All he's got is, like, himself and, like, a stick, like a poker by the fireplace. So he's like, you want to get nuts? Let's get nuts. Yeah. And he starts, like, smashing everything up mm -hmm. and gets mm -hmm. shot. Okay. Oh, it makes total sense. Yep. Yeah, that's what's sure. happening here. So <laughs> clearly A.L. Singer doesn't see the charms of Corey Haim. With a swagger that was meant to be like John Wayne, but it looked more like Pee Wee Herman, Les walked up the door of the bar and kicked it open. Notice that when he gets excited, his voice is higher than Pee Wee <laughs> yes! Herman. And meanwhile, Feldman sounds like a lady who has been smoking for 80 years. Can I just talk for a second about how much I fucking hate Corey Haim? What, what is wrong with him? Like, his nose, it seems like if you tried to stick your finger up his nose, you would just encounter... A solid flesh. Like, he clearly cannot breathe through his nose. He never shuts his mouth. He breathes through his mouth the whole fucking movie. And his voice... How could his voice not have broken by this age? What is he, like, 28 in this movie? I reckon you would have more problems if you tried to stick your finger up Corey Haynes' nose. <laughs> Jess, I think you would be looking at a whole different situation. <laughs> Nestled in the back, Sick Sam sat with a woman who made the Bride of Frankenstein look like a cover girl. What the fuck does that even mean? She was made of dead body parts? And that's bullshit. Like, have you seen that movie? The Bride of Frankenstein is smoking. I know, she's really pretty. She's fantastic. Yeah, I don't know. Then this... Oh, I don't even know. I was. I honestly wanted to see it in the movie because I thought, 
Are they going to make this make sense? It didn't appear. Les turned back to the bar. He picked up the overflowing shot glass. A voice inside him reminded him that he'd never had a drink in his life. Didn't he have champagne 50 pages ago? That was piss. That's true. I remember. Okay, now he tells the bartender the bourbon's too weak and he needs a stronger drink. What is his end game here? What is he trying to achieve? He'd kill himself. And he eats a worm out of a tequila bottle and the pirate guides are like, whatever, we'll beat you up anyway. Anyway, they get away from those guys. They switch cars and accidentally seal Six Sam's cash box and leave Mercedes in the trunk, which could be the catalyst for something really exciting to happen. They just put back the money and take Mercedes before anything could actually happen. Like a plot. Yes. I mean, he does shoot out their back window and cause them to smash into a lamppost, but Jumps whatever. onto the back of the car like the Terminator. <laughs> And like three hyenas let out of a cage, Les, Dean and Charles screamed with laughter. Seeing as contempt is starting to shine through, let it out. And then, Uh, deus ex baby na. It's dawn, mummy's having the baby. Oh, will the car get back in time? Will the car go back in time? (laughs) I wish. Yeah. But Les had a creeping sensation of doom. What had begun as an innocent drive had exploded in his face. What had begun as an innocent auto theft from his family, followed by innocently putting an unconscious girl in the trunk of a car, followed by innocent auto theft from a car yard, had somehow become a real problem. And ironic, because he wanted to explode in her face, right? (laughs) (laughs) Boys! Oh, Les, Mercedes cried as she awakened from her sleep. She looked up groggily into his eyes. I... I just had the most bizarre dream. It was as if I were trapped inside the trunk of a car and then suddenly the trunk flipped open and there you were rescuing me. It was so weird. Les carried her up the path to a front door. He tried to laugh nonchalantly. It uh, does sound kind of crazy. Way to go, Les. Gaslight her. Make her think she's crazy. She wasn't trapped in a trunk. Why, you'd have to be some kind of psychopath to lock an unconscious, possibly alcohol poison girl in a trunk so she didn't hurt your chances of picking up other girls. Oh, I'm so glad this romance has a happy ending. Jess, this is Car Safety 101. <laughs> you always keep a spare in the trunk. <laughs> You just never know. <laughs> what the fuck? Les cruises into the open garage. His parents are standing in front of without them noticing. Because his mum's contractions, which are three minutes, she decides that they're actually gas? What the fuck? Sounds like she's given birth to something, though. And, yeah, no, she's in labour. And, by the way, f- to take it from someone who's been in labour, it doesn't feel like a fart. So, Dad finds the car. What was he going to do anyway? Like, was he going to just pretend, oh, someone broke in and smashed the car up. I've been in my bed all night. That's not a bad skate. <laughs> I guess. Okay, so now this is where I started to get really, really angry. You, you are losing your voice with rage. <laughs> I here. really am. You are this. <laughs> sound like I never, pro film uh, by the end of this. I never thought, like, <laughs> a book would break you. <laughs> I'm not used to it. That's why. I, I used to be tough. But yeah. now I'm weak. And this is a long episode for you too. Oh, my God. It is 8.45. I will tell you right now, I am usually in bed by 8.15. That's ridiculous. <laughs> I am up sometime between 4.30 and 5.30. Yeah, well, I use a condom. <laughs> now, Liz's mum, who is giving birth, wants her teenage son, who does not have a licence, who snuck out of the house to steal their car and completely trashed it to drive her to the hospital so her husband can sit in the back with her. Nope. No. 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 Yeah. It, it's, so, it's so crazy. No. Like you realize watching the film, this is what's going to happen. Like, and this is really like a way for him to undo, undo the punishment, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, of exactly. Proving himself. No, I can drive dad. She's letting their 10 year old sit in the front seat. Good work, mum. And, of course, the other car's are broken. They have to drive reverse all the way to the hospital. Sounds pretty safe. Much safer than stopping, getting someone to call a fucking ambulance. I actually thought he would show some skill here and do it definitely without a problem. But he actually drives yeah. up on the sidewalk and he <laughs> smashes, like, a ton of property. He wrecks a cafe. He racks up, like, thousands of dollars of damage. And so this insane driving sequence begins. And I finally understand the audience for this movie. Um, this is at the point where I still didn't realise it was a comedy. It's people who like to see things, uh, cars nearly hit things, and also cars actually hitting things. Like, how many people do you think would be dead by the end of this movie? At least ten, right? Yeah, easily. And then someone in the book actually does a double take. 
I take everything back. This movie is great. It just crossed the line back to great. Mr. Anderson reached out and put his arm around him. Where did you learn to drive like that? He asked, amazed. Les felt a huge weight lift from his shoulders. His dad was actually smiling. I don't know, Dad. I guess last night. It must have been some crash course. Les laughed as his dad gave him an affectionate squeeze. What about the car? Les said. Mr. Anderson shrugged. Maybe we can fix the car before Grandpa gets home. He'll never notice. What the fuck kind of parenting is that? testosterone fueled parenting. <laughs> and we are at the end. Oh, God. So, uh, yeah. Shall we read it? Yeah, let's go. Um, if it were... The, it's talking about the car. If it were a person, it would have crawled into the hospital for treatment. Maybe not. Instead, it may have looked up and seen the enormous girders hovering over it, teetering at the end of a wobbly crane. In panic, it may have torn out into the street when it saw the construction workers shouting and running for cover. But it wasn't a person. In fact, before two seconds were up, it wasn't much of a car either. With a deafening boom, the girders crashed down on top of it. And when the cloud of dust began to settle, when the last piece of chrome tinkled to the ground, a voice floated up from among the scraps. It sounded like Frank Sinatra, and it came from the only moving thing in the rubble, a creaking cassette player. But as it echoed in the morning air, it may as well have been the voice of the car itself. That's life! Which is different from the movie. Yes, and at this point, I wrote, wait, this was a comedy that makes so much more sense, I literally had no idea. (laughs) Yeah. So, stupid ending, but a much better ending than the actual movie, which has this whole pointless scene with the grandfather coming back. Grandfather turns up, and they go... And he says, what's that? And he's looking at the smashed up car, which is just completely flat. Okay, why did they get this smashed up car towed back to their house? Also, why hasn't insurance paid for it because it got smashed in a building accident outside the hospital? <laughs> so Granddad's like, what's that? And they're like, that's your car. And he goes, ha, ha, And they're thinking, why is this guy laughing? And then he goes, I had an accident with your car too. And then a tow truck brings up another smashed up car. And it's basically like, ha fuck you, I smashed your car. And they're like, oh, well, fuck you, we smashed your car. And he's like, fuck you, I smashed your face. And It's yeah. so weird and dumb. And then there's some stupid, oh, that's right. And then his dad says, oh, I can't buy you that BMW. And he said, and the kid goes, don't worry, I have a Mercedes. And then he jumps in his girlfriend's car. He jumps car. into his Mercedes. Yeah. And gets inside his Mercedes. That's the And movie. rides it into the sunset. Yeah. <laughs> So I'm going to ask you, Jess, fearing the answer that I might unleash, was the was the book better? God, they didn't have that fucking epilogue, so that was a help. Um, oh, they both just made me so angry. What's your answer? No. Yeah. I'll always go for Feldman in person. It was Feldman actually, it was pretty easy to watch. It wasn't painful. It wasn't like Mr. McGorian or something where no, you're wincing no, no, through no. every minute. It was pretty easy to watch. So yeah, no, the book was not better. The book was not better. It was fucking long there was for only, a movie about a film where nothing <laughs> happened. Only one review on Amazon. No. One review, one star. <sighs> This book corresponds to the movie of the same name that was also released in 1988, starring Corey Haim as a teen who just flunked his driving (laughs) test, and then the unknown actress Heather Graham as the blonde of his dreams. This story is quite similar to other teen comedies of the 1980s. Funny, (laughs) but not hilarious. Wacky, but not whacked out. The book and story can be easily taken in over an afternoon. Many American teenagers probably have some first-hand experience with the adventures of the protagonist. Overall, this book is not worth the time to read it. That review is not worth the time to read it. <laughs> Many American teenagers have probably stolen cars or put girls in trunks. Now, I like this, though. So, li- this is the film. Okay. Because I had, to, I, like I said, I had a look because I, I was dissatisfied at reviews. Yes. A lot of five-star reviews for the film. This is my favourite. License to drive rules. It's about time this movie came out for DVD. This is the movie that put the Corey and Corey era in overdrive. Me being a guy was a big fan of the Corys. <laughs> just for the record, I like girls. <laughs> I just found them super cool. <laughs> I hope the DVD has lots of extras with commentary from both. Hands down, a must have on DVD. And this is from David Vale, manager of Richie's Gym. So he's in a gym. He's around wow. a lot of dudes. He likes girls. Just for the record. He likes girls. He likes girls. He's got to maintain the, the image. Wow. 
But being a guy, obviously, big fan of the Corys. Well. Like how, most guys. How could you not be? Holy moly. What was that, like three hours that we just talked about License yeah. to Drive? and it's not over yet, Jess, because oh, no. we promised the listeners, I promised oh, listeners, you did, yeah. and forced it's it upon nothing. you. Yeah. The book was better awards, yeah. episode 100. I wanted to reflect. I wanted to look back. And what better way than to have our own listeners come up with the categories. Yes. And to vote on the awards. And you wouldn't have seen the outcome for some of these. Nope, I haven't. So let's go into Oscars mode. Uh, these are now, not everybody goes to our Facebook page. Um, some people have things to do. Yeah. So if you don't, you missed out on all this, and this will be all new to you, but we suggested we wanted a, a little award ceremony for episode 100, something special to reflect on everything that's been, and this is what we came up with. And uh, thank you to everybody who took the time to fill in the survey and vote. I'm pretty impressed with how this all wrapped up. So yes. the very first award... Well, shall, shall we... Um an- announce the category and then the other person do the award. What do you think? Sure, yeah. Yeah, we'll yeah. swap around. Oh, All right. Well, well, no, when they have presenters at the Oscars, don't they take turns with the categories? Yes, that's true. Like they go back and forth with the nominees. Let's do that. Yeah, and then they take turns with the, the winner. Sure. So the first award is for the best animal protagonist in a novelization. And the nominees are The Cat from Alien. The cat from Terminator. The snake from Terminator 3. The monitor lizard from Godzilla. (laughs) The dolphin in Jaws 2. And the winner is... The cat from Alien. Now, this was a clear winner. This was Jones the cat. Yes. Oh, I remember him well. And Alan Dean Foster actually got inside the cat's thought processes as he watched dust motes, if I recall correctly. (laughs) Fascinating. And Sigourney Weaver, walking around in her underwear, put her whole life in danger just to save uh, this existential crisis-having cat. cat. Amazing. Uh, Next is the award for the most obnoxious padding in a novelisation. And the nominees are Terminator 3, Rise of the Machines. Wild Wild West, in which two background characters have a pages spanning conversation which reads like a who's on first routine before being knocked out. Batman Forever, which takes about 80 pages to get to the film. Sergeant Pepper's pages and pages <laughs> of musician names, plus all the song lyrics. Garfield behind-the-scenes <laughs> inserts. Which included outtakes <laughs> from the film. <laughs> and a list of catering. <laughs> and the winner is Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. This was literally yeah. about a four or five-page list of names. Yeah. Batman Forever. Come, came in close, but it was still a clear winner. Sergeant Pepper for the win. Now, this is one that I think people were held very dear. The best celebrity impersonation on the show. And the nominees are Courtney Coulson as Rick Moranis. Xavier Rubetsky Nunes as John Travolta from the Grease episode. Jessica McLeod as Bill Cosby. And Luke Milton as Schwarzenegger. And look... <laughs> Absolute landslide <laughs> here, without a doubt. It was... And Jessica McLeod is the Bill Gatsby still got. Jessica McLeod is the Bill Gatsby. She's celebrity impersonating. She's a prototypic person impersonating. Can't be beaten. Look at that. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic. <laughs> Now, here is the award for the thinnest book that we attempted to pass off as an actual novel. (sighs) Um, The nominees are Milo and Otis. The Star Trek comic (laughs) adaptation. That was when Courtney and I threw together something to get it on the spot. The Phantom Menace comic adaptation. That was a Halloween episode. (laughs) Uh, Pokemon Mewtwo Strikes Back. (laughs) And Beast Lords. Which wasn't actually a book. And the winner by uh, Nose Hair... Milo and Otis. Yes. The with, picture book. With Mike Taylor, <laughs> a, a very small book mostly comprised of photos of the film. It's basically some lolcats. That's it. Now, here is the George Guype Memorial Award for craziest addition to the film's canon. What a great category. Only three nominations here. And the nominees are Short Round's brother is possibly reincarnated as an elephant in Temple of Doom. The Mogwais are actually aliens in Gremlins. And Back to the Future opens with nuclear Armageddon. And, and clear winner here. Yeah. Short Round's brother. Yeah. Possibly an it. elephant. I love it. It is it is maybe not the most important 
addition to a canon, but it is the weirdest. It is batshit. And his long conversation in his mind about it. So weird. Batshit and, like, borderline racist as well. Yeah. Like, like everything that we love. That is absolutely true. I'm, I'm vamping because I'm moving around <laughs> our windows. Um, the Moist Cleft Award <laughs> for most awkwardly or grossly described sex scenes. The nominees are Terminator Triple X scenes. <laughs> The Flash Gordon, Ming, and his daughter oh. incest, including the boar worms that go into your colon that he suggested she might enjoy. Ah, the robot stalker in Flubber. That takes us back, yeah. doesn't it? Uh, Terminator 2 truck driver's erotic daydreaming about the bored waitress. And the computerettes in Sergeant Pepper. More computer love. And uh, clear winner here as well has to go to the Terminator triple X scenes. I do not have a weak stomach. I literally was squirming with horror listening to you and Liz saying those words. It made me so... I'm usually the person making other people uncomfortable. It made me so uncomfortable. I'm pretty sure I was see, I made the noise... It's all red. It was get all awful. Hot and red. It was awful. And now I can't get hard without it, so thanks. You can't stop thinking about uh, Linda Hamilton's clitoris. Yeah. Best Amazon review of a novel like that. <laughs> And the nominees are the one where the reviewer's house burned down yesterday and they need a new copy of the book. <laughs> the one where the guy reads Poltergeist and then his remote control <laughs> and becomes haunted. I love it so much, but they show the baby's privates. Why is it? You creators, are you trying to expose the baby? <laughs> Man of Steel. <laughs> yes, a, a reviewer that got <laughs> caught up in the fact that the, the film, not the book, mind you, showed the baby's cock. Private. And the baby's the, private. And the winner is... The one where the reviewer's house burned down. It's classic. I love it. It only burned down <laughs> yesterday, too, and it got straight on to Amazon and started, re- started replacing the things that they love. <laughs> All right. Um, now, this is an interesting one. Most awkward translation of a mm. musical into text. The nominees are Frozen. High School Musical Trilogy. Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. Hannah Montana, the movie. And Grease. And it tie. is a tie. Tied result. High School Musical Trilogy tied with Sgt. Pepper. I actually voted for Grease. Really? Yeah. yeah. Only because in Grease there's that bit where she's like, I had this weird dream. <laughs> I think it was a dream. There was this angel. I think he was a teenager. <laughs> yeah. But no, look, they're all great. High school musical, basketball, basketball, basketball. Yeah. They, they remember the song that just comes out of nowhere in the cafeteria. Everybody yes. starts like singing. Let's and talk dancing. about how we like things that aren't always the things people think we will like. Yeah. Yeah. Best out of context comedy corner. <laughs> only three oh, here. Well and it, it was really close. Dick brushed past him as he headed for the back door. That is the best line in literature, let alone. <laughs> Anything else? That's from Batman and Robin. Uh, Fanny clutched tightly at Little John's hand from Robin Hood. Have you ever had a Fanny clutch tightly? Yeah. Yeah. She had to tug quite hard to get it off, and he staggered forward. Labyrinth. Uh, Dick is the winner. Yeah, Can't it go had past to be a bit of Dick. Although close, close to Labyrinth, Labyrinth was yeah. very close behind. Um, Batman novels with Robin in them are always a, a wonderful source of. Dick. <laughs> Best burgers slash other food. The nominees are Raining Burgers in Kazam. Richie Rich owns his very own McDonald's. The food that they eat or talk about eating at the movies in First Daughter. The food that they eat or talk about eating in Babysitter's Club. At the movies in Babysitter's <laughs> Club. And poor kids craving McDonald's in Santa Claus the movie. Do you remember that poor kid yeah. at the window at Christmas <laughs> watching people eat so McDonald's? So happily in McDonald's, at, <laughs> which is runs counter to any McDonald's experience I've ever had. I know, that was my favourite, but the clear winner... Richie Rich owns his own McDonald's. That, and that's how you can tell that he's upper class. That is the American dream. Yes. Best worst ending. Good. Three three here. And the nominees are Pirates of the Caribbean, Stranger Tides. Spider-Man 3, which you remember has no Sandman yeah. resolution whatsoever. They kind of forget that Sandman is even in the film. <laughs> And Sandman woke up and it was all a dream. And Thor, where Loki isn't even the villain. Yeah, missing the last third of the story. <laughs> and Loki's just his uh, misunderstood brother. 
best action typing. Oh, we didn't read the the winner was Pirates of the Caribbean: oh. Stranger Tides. Yes, but can you recap that one? Uh, missing the third, he doesn't find the item that he's been looking for the <laughs> the entire time. Everyone just goes home. It's oh, just enough that we all had fun together. And I hadn't seen the movie. It's like, and then he set off to find the Fountain of Youth. And I was like, wasn't that the whole <laughs> point? They should put a sticker on the book that says, no spoilers. No ending. Uh, best action typing. This is a good one. And the nominees are The Net. Hackers. Batman and Robin. And it had to be. It's clear the, It's The Net. Yes. Where action typing started, I believe. <laughs> Best original song. <laughs> now this is a close one. Mm. The nominees are Sabrina sings Hannah Montana. Courtney improv- improvises Bimini the dog in the bikini. That was in our Beverly Hills Chihuahua. <laughs> Luke's Spider-Man <laughs> Bites Your Dad in the Shed remix. And Lizzie and Lauren's Do You Want to Do a Podcast. And Xavier's Not Too Twee For Me theme cover. That's the more rocking cover that we uh, play sometimes instead of the opening. Another close one, but it is Lizzie and Lauren. Do you want to do a podcast? Which was beautiful. That uh, made yeah. it, it was very poignant. I do have a soft spot for uh-huh. Spider-Man Bites You Dead. <laughs> I do love that one, though. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, does whatever a spider can, lays his eggs in your bed, bites your dad in the shed. Yeah. Most novel approach to a novelization. Author haunted by Freddy in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. Thor tells the events of the story <laughs> twice, once from Thor's point of view, once from Loki's point of view, and then <laughs> entirely skips the ending. Grease as told through the eyes of a character we don't care about and who wasn't there for a lot of the story. Yeah, so there's a bit where he's like, Oh, yeah, so the girls were all doing this thing and they told me about everything they said and now I'm going to tell you it. And there's the bit where he's like, they were all talking in the toilets. Look, I'm not a pervert or whatever. I was just hanging outside the toilets and I just happened to hear what they said and this is it. But clear winner here by a landslide. Author haunted by Freddy in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. That was a very unique gimmick. That's very. It's actually, yeah, it's it's actually interesting, which is a big deal for a novelization. I loved it as well. If people remember that episode, he, he wrote the novelization parts quite seriously, but then in his diary where he was being haunted by Freddy, he sounded like just an absolute <laughs> frat boy douchebag <laughs> dickhead. He was all like, oh, when I finish this novelization, we are going to celebrate. We are going to have a big-ass party with some big-ass honeys. And you're just like, no one's ever had a novelization rap party. (laughs) Your novelization rap party is a bowl of cereal. Yeah. (coughs) Favourite author. Oh, this is a big one. And we've got some uh, write-in votes here as well. So... The nominees are George Guype. Who wrote uh, Back to the Future, Temple of Doom, Gremlins. He's, he's a big favourite of yours. Whitley Stryber. The absolute lunatic. Catch it insane author with some of the best metaphors ever. He's one of my favourites. Sean Hudson. He wrote uh, the incredibly violent, gory, sexy, extreme <laughs> yes. Terminator. And Arthur Byron Cover. He wrote Flash Gordon, which is just an insane book. It's far more insane than the film. It is just completely filthy, perverted, <laughs> and, and fucked up. But in spite of that, the winner well, is... Well, hang on. We've got oh. some writing votes. Oh, we've cool. got We've got James Kahn, mm-hmm. who uh, wrote Poltergeist, oh, yes. which is a really solid book. Joan D. Vinge, the Vinge Meister. Just an all-rounder. I think people, whoever wrote in that just wanted to type Vinge... Alan Dean Foster. Oh, God, one of my favourites of all time. Gentleman and a scholar. He's a bit wordy, but he was the first one who made contact with us, and he's great. And Todd Strasser. A machine. That man is is a novelisation machine. And he loves fashion. Yes, he does. But the winner, we're quite a comfortable winner Mm. too, George Guype. Your man. Man, George Guype, and it, it, it's a sad one too, because as we know, George Guype, about a year after writing Back to the Future, which is one of my favourite books, uh, was stung to death by bees. Yeah, a sadly comic ending. Hmm, to a great man. And you wonder, like, what novelizations he could have written Yes. otherwise, like, step up all in, <laughs> you know? But, yeah, he, he really did, um, he... He put an effort in, which is more than you can say of a lot of them. Okay, we've got three more awards. <sighs> this- Best... Written book. Oh, that is a very controversial idea. Okay. Back to the Future. Return to Oz. Labyrinth. Poltergeist. 
Santa with muscles. Beast Lords. 30 Days of Night. And Howard the Duck. <laughs> Is that your vote? No, it wasn't. But <laughs> it's true. It was a write-in vote, but it's true. That was a really well-written book. I, I didn't get it when I was a kid, mm. but it's so subversively funny. Like, the Did writer you get was anything a, about Howard the Duck when you were a kid? Uh, no, I thought the condom was, like, bird shit currency. <laughs> He has a condom in his wallet out of the wrapper. <laughs> so weird. And gross. And the winner is... Santa with muscles. Aww. Yeah. You know, that's what... By the best writers of all. Any author that ever goes like, oh, this is so easy, you do it. We fucking did it. Yeah. It was easy. Fuck you, yeah. And, we, and, <laughs> and people, I'll do it for money and people, any day. And people loved it. People fucking loved it. Worst written oh, book. Oh, God. How could you even think? Uh, anyway, there's so many that could be here. Garfield. Battleship. Remember the battleship, that nearly headless Nick joke? Yes. Uh, oh, man. <laughs> the Smurfs. Spider-Man 3. And there's a write-in vote of Pirates 4. And, and the clear Fire winner Lanslide. here. The Smurfs. I fucking read that book. Ah. God damn it! That was a horrible, horrible book. And this is the big one. <gasps> Favorite oh. episode. A lot of write-in votes. Okay. So a lot of nominees here. The nominees are the net. Jessica. I didn't. I, that's not written there, but just let's all remember. Ghost Dad. Oh, Hannah, Mont- Hannah Montana the movie. Terminator. New Nightmare. Beast Lords. Santa with muscles. Alien. Freddy's New Nightmare. Flash Gordon. Wait, that was New Nightmare. Uh, Over the Top. Oh, yeah, we had New Nightmare. Yeah, okay. Still didn't win. Sorry. (laughs) Batman and Robin. And the comment, lots of dick there. (laughs) And prom. And the winner is... Episode Woo! 50. That was your triumphant return as yeah, well, it wasn't was. it? Yeah, was. So probably going to be about another 50 episodes before yeah. we have another uh, really good one. And it better be this one, like when you think about your other favourites. I, I think, think it, it probably will this, be. This is, I think yeah. this is a, a pretty triumphant return. I really hope so. It's so long look, enough. Wow, that was really fun. That was actually that super, stuff. super fun. Thank you, everybody, for, for doing that. And... Um, it means a lot to us. And speaking of which, uh, we haven't had iTunes reviews for a really long time. Um, on the Australian store, it's actually been a year, oh, which wow. is really kind of sad. But in comes Logo Boros. Nice. I, I feel like I'm not saying that correctly. Yeah. Who wrote a, a very thoughtful, it's quite a long review, but we always read the review out. And I think if there's a time to do it, it's the hundreds. Yeah, let's go. And uh, I want to say as well, well, no, let's read this. It's titled Comedy and Insight, which is such a good title. I've been listening to The Book Was Better for a little over two years and have gotten a huge amount of pleasure from the show. It's changed and evolved a bit over that time, but the core concept has remained the same. The hosts review and crack wise about the novelisation of movies. The movies are diverse, good and bad, old and new, popular and obscure. And the novelizations are similarly varied, ranging from quish, quick cash grabs targeted at preteens to proper adult novels, sometimes even a bit too adult, so to speak, with prose ranging from the cringeworthy to the surprisingly evocative. So though the format is similar to what one gets with any bad movie podcast, there's a lot more variety in the objects of scrutiny than you might expect. It also helps that unlike movie podcasts that might only occasionally intersperse a couple of clips or trailers of the film they're discussing into the episode, the book was better is able to read quite a few selected passages and unintentionally hilarious sentences from the books and give you a much more direct feel for what the book is actually like, which means you can get a lot out of any episode, even if you haven't read the novelization, which of course you (laughs) probably haven't, or even if you haven't seen the movie. Luke and his guest hosts are very funny, but they also bring some genuine analysis to these books and actually engage with them. It's a comedy podcast but it genuinely delivers on its premise rather than just using it as an excuse to do improv. Indeed, the first 30 or so episodes almost work as a course in the stock techniques and devices of novelization writers. Some might say they're the best episode. No, he didn't write that. Uh, later episodes don't focus quite as much on hashing out the craft of novelization since the rules get pretty well sorted out in that first year of episodes, but you still get regular insights into the tropes of characterization and cultural stereotypes, as well as the novelization genre's eternal need for padding, padding, and more padding. If you're interested in writing, interested in film, interested in pop culture, and if you like your comedy mixed with a dose of cultural criticism or vice versa, I highly recommend the book was better. Isn't that a beautiful summary for 
episode 100. That is really lovely and thoughtful and gives us way too much credit. But yeah, I, I love it. I want to say as well just how much I do love this. And I love uh, Logo Boros. Yes. Is yes, that me too. Um, this person also wrote an equally thoughtful review on FP Cast and Aww. on Scar Joe Gogo and really got to the essence of all three of the shows. Oh. And it's that you. is, uh, I get it. And that, and that is. Oh, I hadn't picked that up till now. That is huge. And I just want to say, like, you know, we're not a podcast that's ever thought about, like, we'll stick a donate button or we'll try and convince you to download books from Audible or yeah. anything like that. And never will. This is really a fun thing to do. And it's really about getting those ideas out there and, and sort of connecting with people. So when people do make the effort to comment and respond and show us that you listen and that you care, uh, that's like what fuels me. Just that yeah. one, just to read that one today is like, really oh, great, deal. this is wonderful, this is worth doing, and, and I really appreciate it. So yeah. thank you. It's really lovely. Thank you so much. That's really, really nice to see. Well, um, come here and see. That makes me very happy. So uh, just to do the little plugs, um, it's a big week next uh, yesterday was a FP cast. It's for um, Jacinta's birthday episode, and no. we're talking about shit that makes you feel old. And there's lots <laughs> of pop culture shit that makes us feel <sighs> old. So uh, that'll be something. We're also reviewing a couple of films. And ScarJo a Go Go is also a really big episode on Thursday because we are finally up to Lost in Translation. Finally up and to a movie that anyone will know, recognize. Really goes <laughs> Yeah. And um, the which opens with the bum shot that uh, signifies her change into womanhood. What a shitty racist movie. But let's not get into that right now. Do you think it's a racist movie? Yeah, I really do. No, I think it's so beautiful. I watched it last night. I love it so much. Oh, God. No. It's adorable. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, lots of um, stuff happening there. Uh, please like all our pages, review us on iTunes, and uh, be generally nice to us. Thank you so much. 100 episodes. There oh we go. Oh, my God. I can't even believe it. Oh, that was the other thing I had to say. Um, I'm going to take some uh, at least a week off. Good for you. I'm going to Singapore. Oh, really? Yeah, um, next week. So Excellent. You'll have this, uh, and what a great, great time to <laughs> Lucky sort of leave. it's four hours long. <laughs> yeah, we got some big week of podcasts. Yeah. <laughs> so I recommend that people, if you're waiting around, if you haven't listened to any of the other shows, have a listen to one of them while you're waiting for a new episode. Because I'm okay. going to take a little break, go overseas, do some crazy things, and uh, then I'll be back for more. Almost thought, like, God, oh, if I was going to retire, 100. Pretty good, pretty good <laughs> oh, time. So tempting. To so do tempting. It. It was tempting for a while there. <laughs> but, uh, but then you read that, that review and you're like, I can't do it. And I can't just do it to the kids. People that I love working with. I mean, that's the main yeah. thing. I love working with, like, you know, like when Lizzie comes around or Leah comes around or Sabrina, you know, it just always refreshes or, you know, Courtney. Yes. And, and people are always going, oh, I just found this book, like, why don't we do this? And you think, yeah, of course. Like, why would I want to stop doing that? You know, it made me really sad to have to take a break when when the kid came along. But to be honest, looking back at it, if we had done those 100 episodes all just together, I think, honestly, we would be done by now. Yeah. I think maybe we would have had enough. I think that having other people has kept it fresh. I think it would have been a, a difficult thing. Like, I don't have a license to drive um, and all the recording stuff's here. Just the fact that, you know, you would have had to keep coming along every fortnight and doing that. And it is a really sort of demanding thing to have to do. Well, there's... And also, it's it's quite an in, like a, a work-intensive podcast. Like, we don't yeah. just turn up and shoot the shit yeah. about what we did. We, you know, we do a fair amount of work, so... But in more than that, I think that... Like, maybe by this point we'd be like, okay, we've made the jokes we needed to make. We've, you know, I don't know. I feel like it's it's made it more special coming back for... Yeah, well, it's always a, like a real treat. And I like having that roster of people. And then it, it's really fun as well to do those episodes. I quite like the episodes where you can hear that I'm getting to know somebody. Mm. Like... I just did prom with Lauren in episode 98, and that was the first time we've actually spoken. Mm. And, you know, we've only spoken for a couple of minutes before we start recording, and you get to hear that 
sort of happen. Yeah. Or, you know, Sabrina, who didn't want to do the show, or Leah, who didn't really want to do the show. (laughs) And then both of those people came back and have just shot, you know, shot and they've been amazing. So, yeah, it's been a really wonderful, challenging experience. I love everything about it except reading the books. (laughs) Fucking books. Why did we choose this? It's like having homework, like I doing know. an essay. Because you're not just going, oh, I'm finding the funny bits. You're, you're trying to get a sense of the story a lot of the time yeah. as well. Like you're trying to make sure that if people haven't seen it, they know who all the characters are. They know what the general plot is. How much can I leave out? How much do I have yeah. to leave in? And then, you know, you're like, oh, you find a funny bit. And you're like, oh, fuck, I have to type all this out now. Jesus Christ. Yeah. So which e-books have been just a godsend. Oh, so because jealous. Just email them to the guest and you cut and paste uh, the excerpts. But I knew this one would be gold and I was not wrong. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I think... It was worth worth the effort. Ghost out at 50. Yeah. Got to break out Feldman for, <laughs> for 100. Absolutely. Well, there we go. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And, um... I'm half dead. Uh. God knows how far this thing will end up going. But, uh, yeah, we're going to take a break, listen to some backlog, listen to some of the other shows. They're all good shows. Put a lot of um, passion into those as well. And um, I guess... Catch you on the flips. Jumanji. (laughs) 